All right, you are on the platform, and a very good morning uh, to you. Um, boy, this wasn't the story I'd planned to, um, we'd planned to lead with uh, when I left the office yesterday. But I got a phone call yesterday uh, evening, afternoon, from, well, a rather insistent phone call from, well, an excited, maybe agitated is the right word, Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union. And if you don't know the Free Speech Union, you should. They're an organisation that promotes, debates, discusses and uh, advocates for free speech in this country. Um, and they bring international speakers here and they have a lot of very good things to say. So Jonathan rang me and he said, we've got an amazing story. And uh, he joins us now by video link to tell us what that story is. Now, I also want to say, Jonathan... We are doing a terrible, committing a terrible crime here. We're breaking an embargo, are we? That's right, Sean. Uh, I don't know if we have to play by the rules of those who are trying to undermine our speech rights. So I say uh, if this is the low that they're going to sink to, we're going to let people know about it. All right. And generally, I'd say embargoes are only justifiable if there is commercial sensitivity involved. Generally, embargoes are just used by government departments and companies to try and maximise their spin. So tell us what you've got, Jonathan. Tell us what has you so agitated. Yesterday we had uh, actually several of our supporters. We've got 80,000 supporters around the country. A few of them uh, managed to get their hands on documents from the Department of Internal Affairs. For over two years, we've been aware of the fact that they've been working on the content regulation review. And uh, that has now been released as a discussion document with uh, legislation suggested within the discussion document uh, to be probably drafted and introduced into the House next year. Uh, one thing I would say is if we're having several of our supporters reach out with these documents, um, the embargo is not working very well. It's a little bit of a sieve. Okay, but, so uh, we are what's... talking about a Department of Internal Affairs discussion document that has been put out with co for consultation that contains proposed legislation around what precisely? So uh, it's suggesting that legislation be drafted in order to entirely reform the censorship regime in New Zealand to uh, establish an entirely new authority. The Broadcasting Standards Authority will go. Uh, the Aotearoa New Zealand online safety harms uh, uh, code will go. Others like this, and it's going to establish... NetSafe, does NetSafe get disestablished, which is a quasi-government organisation? No, NetSafe uh, hangs around. In fact, I think uh, I think they will uh, probably be quite uh, looking quite healthy uh, as something like this comes through. Okay, and what uh, about the office of the chief censor? There would be aspects of that that are amended as well, and so uh, that it's it's a significant overhaul, one that we haven't seen for for several decades. Their entire premise is that in the digital age, the restrictions that the government places on information are outdated, and they're not wrong. When the internet came along, mm. uh, the idea was that this would be a free uh, environment where where governments wouldn't be capable of imposing. Censorship. And, and someone mm. put it to me like this yesterday, uh, you know, when, when the printing press came out, there were some governments that embraced it and some that really cracked down on it. And the response there had implications for decades, if not centuries, mm. in terms of the literacy rate in those countries, the wealth and the capacity for them to engage in a changing environment. Mm. I don't think... Uh, trying to control the internet uh, and certainly not control the speech of Kiwis on the internet is actually a progressive or forward oh, foc uh, focus yeah. way. So they would suggest a new censorship body specifically around the internet which would have the authority to what? Fine, imprison, compel people to not say certain things on the internet and who would decide what you could say and couldn't say according oh, no. to the discussion document? Uh, uh, Sean... You and I both know they're smart enough to not put any of that in the document. So as you read through the document, and my team and I, there are three documents we were reading through the mm. over 100 pages last night trying to get through the details. Uh, what this discussion document is saying, hey, have you seen something that's nasty online? Don't you think that shouldn't be there? Why don't we stop that? 
That's but about it. it but what it this doesn't say do, how we're going to stop that. So what this what this will do is it will set up a regulator, a regulator whose broad aims will be defined by Parliament. And once the regulator is set up, the regulator is the one who will decide what content will be allowed. Oh, you can't have that. It's context. got to be the people that decide, not some bureaucrat. Jonathan, that's ridiculous. Well... Uh, you know, wh whether we should be having a conversation at all around uh, whether anyone in New Zealand should be able to comment on someone else's speech online or anywhere, wh wh whether we've reached such a low with regards to free speech is one thing. Whether now someone distinct from Parliament, set aside from our democratic, accountable, representative structure should be deciding that, that shouldn't even be a question to me. This is going to be, the, the, the code is going to be established apart from Parliamentary Select Committee oversight. It's not going to have any MPs functioning in it and everyday Kiwis will not have accountable representative involvement in this. All there right. uh, will be some industries that get to have their say but you know what they can be like. Uh, Jonathan, it sounds like something that Kate Hanna and the Disinformation Project could have written this discussion document. Hey, there's a whole lot of nasty stuff out there. We must do something about it. There are Nazis everywhere. Is it written... Or is it couched in those paranoid terms? No, it's not. And and uh, so credit to some of the team at DIA. We've had the opportunity to meet with them on this project several times. I was actually surprised when I saw the discussion document come out uh, with the tone that it does and with the content that it does because as we've been working with them, they have been acknowledging significantly, and they do in the discussion document as well, the importance of free speech. But it's almost like, with so, as with so many other people, yeah, I believe in free speech, yeah, it matters, but surely these nasty things should still be removed. That's not then free speech. And uh, and I would say the team there has have gone some way in saying that a, a, a hyper-strict approach by the government locking people up isn't on the table, fine. But we're talking about things like shifting algorithms. So you may be able to post online, but no one will see it. Uh, that's ah, still okay. a, a, an incredible involvement of, of an oversight body connected to the state, at least, that is going to have huge implications on the way public discourse is done in New Zealand on really crucial issues. Mm. Do you think there is a need for some regulation or rules around what happens on the internet? And I look at the platform. Um, you know, the platform, we're not subject to the Broadcasting Standards Authority. We're not a member of the Media Council. We do what we want. But we do it responsibly, and we're also subject to all the criminal codes and civil law codes of New Zealand, which do govern our behaviours, and we do take into account. But we don't specifically need anything about what we specifically do because we don't defame people, and we act with integrity in a commercial sense as well. It seems to me that we don't need any more rules. Well, I would say absolutely there should be rules. But as you point out, there Why? are rules. There Why? Are Why if people like behave well? <laughs> and, 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 Sean, when I say that, I'm talking about things like child pornography or terrorist oh, yeah. activity. Yeah. Okay. And often... Often we see these two conversations dovetail. That's why I want uh, I want us to note this. We use really extreme, patently objectionable material like child pornography yeah. or terrorist activity or inciting others to kill themselves, things that are already very clearly illegal. Yeah. And then we try and we connect it with a whole bunch of nasty stuff or not even nasty stuff, yeah. just things that other people disagree with. You can be sure that the sacred cows that the Free Speech Union keeps on talking about, the handful of subjects that it just seems no matter who you're talking to, everyone feels uncomfortable to discuss these nowadays. Mm. But important issues for us to address, you can be sure that aspects of these will be caught in, in censorship online like this. And it was interesting, recently, we when we had Professor Nadine Strossen here, a, a global expert on hate speech laws, we hosted an interagency event. Uh, and, and, and one of the participants that was there from New Zealand police said, we have so many laws already. This was in reference mm. to hate speech laws. W will another one accomplish the, the social cohesion that we want in, in society? And I think it's a very fair point. With all the legislative attempts that we've had at creating this utopian society, 
are they actually working? And is one more law going to be the one that gets us there? I, I think you, you can have the objectives in mind that this discussion document has and what the legislation probably will have without going th that this has to be a regulatory response. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, is there anywhere in the world that we could look at where this has been done so we could see in, in real terms how it might pan out? <laughs> well, well, we, we, we're told, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, lots of other countries like us have laws of this kind. And so uh, we're pointed to uh, legislation in Australia and, 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 and the, the EU Digital Services Act, which is just an, a piece of work, I tell you. Uh, and one of the ones that they refer us to is the uh, online safety bill in the United Kingdom, uh, which the Free Speech Union in the United Kingdom, our counterparts, uh, has been working against for years for the very same reasons that that we are concerned with this piece. So when I saw them say in this discussion document, don't worry, the EU are doing the, uh, excuse me, the UK are doing the online safety bill, I thought, okay, that tells us the tone of this conversation. This is about um, paternalistic approaches to, to silencing speech that makes people feel uncomfortable. And there can be a whole lot of good intentions accompanied with that. And at the very end of the day, it still has disastrous consequences. When, when we have spoken with the IA in the past, they've said, oh, free speech, you know, absolutely it mattered in the past and it still matters now. But Jonathan, we're in a totally different context now. You can't point to historical examples. They don't count anymore. Yeah. Is this because, because partly, Jonathan, we have had groups like the Disinformation Project create a false narrative about just how dangerous the internet is. They have taken and focused on the 8chan and the deepest, darkest corners of the internet rather than looking at the real picture, which is somewhat more moderate than you might get painted by a disinformation project report. There's a confluence of factors here. Uh, the, the work of the likes of the disinformation project very much come into play. I would note that this project actually started uh, about the same time that mm. the disinformation project was first set up. So it's it's not a direct correlation between those two entities. But as I always say, Sean, this is a cultural issue where over the past several decades, certainly over the past seven to ten years, we have shifted in our way of thinking with regards to information, with regards to differences of opinions, and we have become far more prone as a society to go certain ideas, certain beliefs, certain speech are too dangerous to be acceptable in our society. And the Free Speech Union would always accept that some ideas are dangerous. Some ideas shouldn't be accepted in a liberal democratic society. So then, the, but the question is, how do you counter them? And it is not by suppressing them. I can promise you that the, the social cohesion, the community interconnectedness that the government ostensibly wants to achieve in this country will not be achieved through suppressing online speech. And it right. would not have been achieved through hate speech laws. All right. Do we have a politician or a political party who are championing this, where can people who want to find out more about it and have their say get involved? Well, uh, the Department of Internal Affairs will be releasing their document. They'll at be 2 o'clock, I'm told, release. this yeah. afternoon. Yeah, at 2, 2 p.m. this afternoon, that's correct. So I would encourage your listeners to uh, make sure you have a look at the material that we're referencing there. Uh, the Free Speech Union, of course, will be running a campaign on this as well, promoting engagement and facilitating Kiwis to have their say. If you think this is a good uh, idea for your speech, we're still happy for you to use our resources to say that. But uh, we will be outlining our concerns in this regard. When we ran a campaign on the hate speech laws, it ended up being the largest public policy concern consultation uh, in New Zealand history. Uh, we ended up running the largest petition on the subject. And of course, we know how that story ended. This is very much uh, hate speech laws for the online world. And uh, we, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that they are trying to achieve the same control over many of the same subjects and, and in the same situations that they were doing in hate speech laws. When I spoke with uh, one of my uh, staffers yesterday, he said, Jonathan, this is the first time that the material that I'm looking at, uh, that, that we're going to be engaging on, I'm terrified of what will happen if we don't win. He said... The now, this is despite this the fact, Jonathan, as you said, there aren't a lot of specifics in this. 
That's because we know how these codes are developed. The Free Speech Union de- uh, submitted 95% of the submissions on the Aotearoa New Zealand online uh, safety and harms code. And yet not, none of the changes were made. It That was... Mm just over a year ago and we were told this is a voluntary code no one is going to be forced into this they are now saying the voluntary code is going to be folded in to these mandatory codes and oh, the so there are going to be these will be mandatory codes because i'm these having an mandatory. argument at the moment jonathan i'm told i can't be an accredited member of the parliamentary press gallery because i'm not a member of a voluntary private organization called the media council and I'm not subject to the Broadcasting Standards Authority, which is odd because I'm not a broadcaster, so therefore I can't be subject to the Broadcasting Standards Authority. So for that reason, uh, Mr. young Mr. Espiner and I are supposedly, by new rules promulgated by the existing legacy media in the press gallery, we are excluded from, from, from going to uh, Parliament to watch its proceedings or indeed go to press conferences in the Beehive to find out what the politicians are up to. Um, so there does, and that seems to me to be a desire to bring the platform under some sort of inverted commas control. The, uh, the way I was told uh, it yesterday is that it's four wolves and a sheep being told to decide together what's for lunch. And so, sure, uh, the Herald and the spin off and stuff uh, are not going to be concerned by these codes because they already exist under similar. Uh, regulation for most people it's about online speech but there is an outlier and it's uh, it's it's journalism like the platform which is currently not under those same codes that will be bought kicking and screaming or not under that control and I think it will quite have quite significant implications for the content that they would seek to see you run on this outfit equally the free speech union has more than 25,000 subscribers we, we have about mm. 80,000 supporters around the country yeah and so if, if a if a platform has more than 25,000 yeah. uh, subscribers they automatically will come under regulation as well I think so that, hang on uh, the free a, speech union as part of this new spin would be part of this new spin uh, censorship deal. Absolutely. So there will be a, a, a series of codes across different areas, and w- as as a platform promulgating content that the government thinks it should have a hand in controlling, we would be part of that. I, I don't think the government should have any role no. in the defence of free speech that the free speech union puts up. It seems very inappropriate that civil society would be regulated in this way. I think it's remarkable. Jonathan, do we have, in real terms, and this was started some time ago, the work on this, and there's been a bit of water under the bridge since. Do we have a politician, like is Kerry Allen say, standing up saying, I'm going to champion this? And seeing we've got an election it, it, coming up, why don't we just get all the political parties to say this is a stink idea and we're, and we're going to tell the Department of Internal Affairs to stop it? Well, it does seem that uh, parliamentary pressure to push this past the election would be a good idea, though I doubt Labour would want to play ball with that. Look, there's been a little bit of a hospital pass here. Minister Jan Tanetti, who of course is in the news yet again for a number of reasons, uh, is the one who's coordinated a lot of this work. Um, the new uh, Minister for uh, Department of Internal Affairs, uh, Barbara Edmonds, is the one who has now uh, had to sign off on this, but she hasn't done much of the work. Of course, she only recently came into the role. And so uh, while the person who's done the work is now not accountable for it, I would say in general, there is a, a host of MPs, unfortunately, not just in the Labour Party and not just on the left either, that are actually very keen on the government having uh, a hand in developing a regulator and codes that will control online speech. I think it is a very regressive, antiquated way of thinking about these issues. Jonathan, I thank you so much for sharing with that this morning, uh, that with us this morning, and we will keep in touch on this story, and certainly keep a very, very close eye on it, uh, because we can, and the government doesn't tell us what to do, and we're not going to join a club that would have us. <laughs> I thank you very much for your time this morning. That is Jonathan Ailing from the Free Speech Union. There you have it. The Department of Internal Affairs starts a discussion on a new censorship body which would take any organisation, media or otherwise, with over 25,000 subscribers, and the government would set up a regulator which, independent of Parliament, would make up rules about what you could say and couldn't say. 
Amazing. Sean, could this legislation be used to shut the platform down? Mike, it probably could. Certainly to clip and restrict our wings. Um, and I also just want to have a quick talk, though. I'll come back to this later. Uh, can I tell you that I got a an email yesterday from Mikey Sherman, who is the president or the chair of the Parliamentary Press Gallery, or the Media Gallery, it should be called, those, is the, those are the journalists who pretty well permanently cover politics and events at Parliament. In the chamber, in the debating chamber, it goes back above the, the House where the MPs sit. I have been a member of that organisation in total, I think, for seven years, uh, young, in the younger days of my career. Um, and I have been, and they've been having me on a rollover every three months of being an associate accredited member, which means I don't have an office there, but I do have certain privileges to get into the building and attend uh, post-cabinet press conferences, which I do from time to time. I was in the process of trying to get associate accreditation for Ben Espiner, so he could learn the ropes down there and spend some time at Parliament. And I got a letter yesterday from Mikey Sherman saying they have changed the rules of accreditation so that now you have to be either a member, your organisation must be a member of the Media Council or subject to the Broadcasting Standards, well, they said actually be a member of the Broadcasting Standards Authority, which is a ridiculous and wrong thing for you to say, Mikey. You can't join the Broadcasting Standards Authority. It's an authority that exercises jurisdiction over people who broadcast in New Zealand. As we don't broadcast, we're not subject to the BSA, and why should I join the Media Council, which has real estate agent people on it, and is just a self-regulatory body with no statutory standing in New Zealand, so why are you running a closed shop at the press gallery at Parliament? Now, Mikey Sherman says we can make exceptions, and I wrote to her yesterday, make an exception for me. I've been around a while. I know my stuff. I am most definitely a journalist. Um, and she also said, and you can apply to the speaker. So I wait with bated breath for her to come back and say, yes, of course, the platform is a journalistic organisation. And of course, uh, Ben and Sean, you can have associate accreditation or they're going to have a crack at us and try and shut us out. And I'm going to say that isn't fair. You're running a closed shop um, and you're basically trying to censor us. I think that would be a fair assumption for me to make. And then we have this from Jonathan Ayling. So there is definitely a mood afoot from legacy media, from those who hold woke power in the existing political structure to shut down those who disagree with them. It is cancel culture writ large. And he, Jonathan may have said this morning we couldn't get details of this discussion document from Internal Affairs. People often ask me, how did all this, for example, Treaty of Waitangi rubbish happen? Well, because when things like this happened, when, the department, when departments put out discussion documents and little things happened, the mainstream media 15 or 20 years ago couldn't be bothered doing stories on it. And suddenly the country finds that it has co-governance as a reality. This is what journalism actually is, and that's what we fight for. I'm going to say to you it is important that we do fight and that organisations like the platform continue the fight. I can only do that if you do a couple of things. Firstly, just listen, discuss, talk, share our stuff. Secondly, as an individual consumer, sign up for Platform Plus or donate or just donate money to us. Platform Plus, only $3 a week. Download the app and the instructions are simple for three bucks a week. And I would also say to all commercial organisations that care about doing business in an open, free democracy, care about markets and the rule of law, advertise with us. Contact our sales department and advertise with us. Make us sustainable so we can literally fight this fight. And this is a fight for free speech. And at the moment, I have to fight to get back into the press gallery so that we can cover politics for you and give you alternative views and narratives.